Chicken, which debuts next week, October 10th, 2018, on the CW Network. It's a series he concepted based on his high school years that he co-produced mere months after leaving the NFL. But that's how this unbelievable story ends. It starts in the underserved South Central LA, where Spencer grew up. But he got a permit to attend the privileged Beverly Hills High. The biggest game of my life wasn't between chalked white lines. It was actually navigating both sides of the tracks of Los Angeles. A standout high school player on offense, Spencer then played defense in college at Oregon. And after a Rose Bowl defeat his junior year, the econ major almost walked away from football to join corporate America. But his teammates changed his mind and he returned and helped take Oregon to their first ever national championship game, but lost on a last second field goal. He then went undrafted in the NFL, floated around L.A. for a summer, but found his way onto the New York Giants. As a rookie, he won a Super Bowl, beat the odds and played seven years in the NFL, but set a goal to retire before age 30. So he taught himself screenwriting, primarily as an escape from memorizing NFL plays, using his play recognition skills to learn the patterns of storytelling. Watching a movie, still having the joy of being you know, away from football in my mind, but now dissecting it with my football mind. He then hung up his cleats, pitched a treatment around his life story to the most prolific television producer in Hollywood, and got it greenlit. Now Spencer has his first producer role with a show that's airing in primetime 10 months after his last NFL game. Like I said, unbelievable. You'll need to hear it yourself. But first, some love for our sponsors who help bring you amazing, inspirational stories like Spencer's. When I need a change of pace from podcasts, I love listening to audiobooks on Audible. So I partnered up with Audible to give new customers a free audiobook. They're an Amazon company, so everything just works, and they've got over 180,000 titles to choose from. Just go to thebigjumpshow.com slash audiobook to get your free audiobook, simply for creating a free account. Again, to start off your Audible account with a free audiobook, go to thebigjumpshow.com slash audiobook. Happy listening. And lastly, I want to say thank you to our sponsor, Grand Voyage, a luxury fashion brand and a personal favorite of mine that makes shoes and bags designed in LA and handcrafted in Italy at the same factories as other premier fashion labels, but at a much better value. GQ says they're, quote, changing the fashion game. And Grand Voyage is perfect if you're trying to change up your fashion game. And by change up, I do mean upgrade. Use the promo code THEBIGJUMP for $35 off the beautiful bags and shoes from Grand Voyage. Yes, $35 off. Go check them out. See what I mean by going to thebigjumpshow.com slash shoes. And from there, as they say, the rest is up to you. And while you're at it finding things online, give the Big Jump a holler on Instagram or Twitter at Big Jump Show. On the podcast charts, season one netted a perfect five-star rating for The Big Jump. And if you're so inclined, I would be grateful if you could show some love by throwing us five stars. And if this is your first episode, don't forget to subscribe. And show notes, get your show notes here. If you're listening while driving or are sharpening knives underwater, show notes for this episode and links to everything mentioned can be found at thebigjumpshow.com. And with that, I give you my unbelievable against all odds, inspiring conversation with Spencer Pacinger. All right, Spencer, thanks so much for being on The Big Jump. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Uh, I've been so excited to sit down and do this with you ever since our mutual friend Devin introduced us. So yeah, this is going to be great. Yeah, I'm glad we were able to sit here. So where I'd like to start our conversation uh, is where I start all the conversations on The Big Jump, and that's with what's your earliest memory playing sports? It was actually a a, a tragic memory. I remember my best friend playing for the Dallas Cowboys of the park that we played at. And I forget what team I played on, but he had broke free. This is flag football, by the way. He had broke free. It was running for a touchdown. And I was able to track him down. But within 10 yards of him scoring, I attempted to dive for his flag and like in my mind, I remember it being like way more triumphant than it looked. But I dove for the flag and missed it and full face of mud after I fell. And he ended up scoring. And I look at my dad and my team, everybody on the sideline. I'm like, 
I failed you guys. <laughs> and that's my that's my earliest football memory or earliest sports memory that I can think of. Why do you think that stuck with you? I don't know. I mean, it's it's a flag football game. I was maybe I was maybe four or five years old, if that maybe. But I don't know. It's just that I remember just looking at my looking at my team and feeling like I truly let you guys down. And it's just interesting, like the the random things that you remember. It is. Did you have a childhood hero growing up? Um, actually, I really like Derek Brooks from the uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Growing up, I knew Derek Brooks was special as a linebacker. This is before I even became a linebacker. Like I wanted to play offense, and even when I was younger, I wanted to be point guard for UNC. Like if you told me I was going to be an NFL linebacker, I would have walked away from you. Like I wanted to play for UNC. I wanted to be sponsored by Jordan. I wanted. You know, the light blue, the dark blue, all that. I wanted to go to UNC. So I don't know how I like Derrick Brooks, but I just knew he was special. What was it about him that you thought, wow, there is something special about this guy? Well, he just early on, and this is obviously this is from like an eight-year-old, nine-year-old lens, but he just had an ease about him. As ferocious as he was, as as great as he was on the um on the Buccaneers and the Buccaneers, I, they were stacked when he was playing, but he was arguably the best player on the Buccaneers team. And he did it with just so much ease, so much poise. You talk about the park and playing with your earliest memory. Where did you grow up? So I grew up in South Central Los Angeles. So if, if anybody's listening to this in Los or has been in Los Angeles, I grew up pretty much down the street where they filmed Boys in the Hood. It's two blocks away from my home. So to paint the picture, that's the area I grew up in. Yeah, I grew up in Minnesota and all I knew of South Central LA is what I heard on rap songs or in movies that I wasn't supposed to be watching. Yeah, yeah. What was it like for you? Honestly, it, it wasn't as bad as people would like to think it is. At the end of the day, you know, my parents kept me in sports. I knowingly didn't go towards the gang life. I have friends and family that did. But, you know, early on, I just knew that wasn't the life for me. And I would have rather been playing basketball, just playing in the street, playing with friends than than doing, you know, anything negative. So I had a normal childhood just like anybody else. Like, I never assumed I was poor or didn't have anything. But, you know, there were days where the water didn't turn on. There were days when the lights didn't turn on, you know. And when that happens, you just, you change up. You say, hey, like, the lights are off, so let's play charades in the dark. Let's like light some candles, play charades. Or if we don't have cable on, okay, we're watching VHS and playing video games. Like you just changed the path. You didn't worry about, you know, what you didn't have. You just worried about what you had at the moment. So all the things that make South Central a a challenging place have been well covered. (laughs) What are some of the things that people might not realize about what makes it a great place? Because, you know, you got a smile on your face as you're talking about your childhood right now. Yeah. The sense of family and community uh, in South Central, I grew up knowing that I had five or six aunts in the area, two or three uncles in the area, and I can go to any of their house. I can ride my bike to any of their house. I can I can be there all weekend, just interchanging between my grandparents' house and my aunt's house. Like The sense of community and family in South Central, I really haven't seen it since. And I've lived in New York. I lived in Miami. I lived in Charlotte. I've lived in different areas of Los Angeles. But there's something about the the sense of community in South Central that I don't think is portrayed properly in the media. Tell me more about your parents and your household growing up. Yeah, yeah. So my, I come from a football family. You know, my older brother played football. My younger brother played football. Uh, my dad played football. He actually went to the same high school as me. And we always do that, you know, that Thanksgiving dinner, like, oh, I think my team would have beat your team. (laughs) But, you know, my mom, uh, she's honestly the strongest person I've ever met. You know, I've ever known uh, just the amount of stuff that she's had to deal with, just raising three boys and like being the only woman in the house of of four men, four huge men too. Like I'm 6'3", 240, and I'm the runt of the family, essentially. Really? Yeah. Yeah. My my brother in his heyday was, you know, 6'2", 330. My younger brother is about 6'1", 6'2", like 250, 260, I mean, 350, 360 right now. So she had to deal with a lot growing up. That's a lot of groceries. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My um, So she works for the police. She's a, a senior clerk typist for the police. She's not in the streets, you know, 
uh, arresting people or anything, but she pretty much manages the house when everything gets back. My dad, uh, he was a football coach for like going on like 30 years now. He actually just pseudo retired. He said he couldn't do it anymore because the kids just weren't as focused as they used to be. And what was the dynamic like between you and your brothers? You were the middle child. (laughs) Were you competitive with each other? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We played, I mean, we were in sports when I was in, I think when I was three years old on, and everything was a competition. How much could you eat? How much could you, you know, drink at breakfast? Or, you know, we had a basketball hoop in our backyard and just playing games of like best of five, best of seven. This is me and my older brother. And my older brother's like, he's always been bigger than me. So I would always win the first game in basketball, but then he'd go into his post move and I could not, you know, stop that. You know, it's it was it's always been competitive with us, but there's always been a sense of love behind it. You know, it's competition, but we're doing it to make each other better. And what was your dad like with you? You know, his life is football. Did he bring that home? And what was that like? Well, it's not that he brought it home. It's that he took us with him. So he was a high school football coach at Beverly Hills High School where where I attended. And from three years old, I was a water boy. You know, seven years old, I was a ball boy for Beverly Hills and then ended up going there to play football. So I knew Friday nights to be Friday night lights. I'm going to Beverly Hills High School. I'm going to watch these, you know, mountain of men clash for two hours and imagine like myself being there. So yeah, it's, it's not so much he brought it home. It's just like it was instilled in us from a young age that we were a football family. So how did that come to be that you're living in South Central but are attending Beverly Hills High School? Shoot, honestly, it happened. Technically, it happened like all the way back in the late 60s. How so? So Beverly Hills High School in the late 60s, the students actually petitioned the school board through their art teacher, uh, Lyle Suter, to integrate the school because the student, and mind you, this is the 60s. So this is, you know, free love. This is, you know, everybody like, let's be peaceful, stop the war. So the students, they just felt like they didn't have a realistic view of the world. And they were looking for kids that had a similar economic background and good standing and grades. Just by luck, my uncle and my, uh, my dad and my uncles, they were going to Emerson. Now they didn't have the same economic background, but they all had good grades. So the first set of Black students enrolled in Beverly Hills in 1969, and my uncle, my oldest uncle, enrolled in 1972. And after that, you know, my other uncle came, my dad came, and then my last uncle came. Ten years after they graduated, three of them went back to coach. Then they just got up the ranks for the most part. And that kind of leads me into the 90s where I'm ball boring, I'm water boring, I'm water boring. And come early 2000s, it was technically my brother and my time to go there. So you had to apply, pretty much state your case, you know, go through the whole application process, and then you can be admitted. And there was actually, when my brother got in, you know, he got in under his grades, everything, everything was great. But, you know, we actually had to work to get myself in there. Um, I don't know the full story behind it, but... I just know that it wasn't a cakewalk to just walk in. It wasn't a legacy that, oh, I'm, you know, my uncles and my brother go here now. I can go here now. So I'd imagine that you came in as somewhat of a known entity, given the last name. My older brother was there three years before myself. So he was the big man on campus back then. And he wasn't the guy that would, you know, knock your books out your hand walking down the hallway. He was by all means a stand up guy. So when I got there, it was that you have big shoes to fill. Your brother's a great guy. Your uncles are great people. Your dad's a great person. My aunt uh, worked there at this time. Uh, my grandparents at the time were running the the snack bar at the sports game. So just we had pacingers that were already there. And now you're plugging in a new pacinger into the machine. And you're like, my sense of it is I need to make sure my shit is 100% or else I'm going to bring harm to the family name. Like we... Me and my brother always talk about, like, you never want to do anything to bring harm to your family name because at the end of the day, that's all you have. So myself, I don't know if I was just in my own head, but there was a sense of I can't let these people down. Sounds like a lot of pressure. It's a lot of pressure. It it definitely was because, you know, obviously my older brother was was a big man on campus. He had 
awesome grades, went, had a scholarship to San Jose State University. And coming in, I was a, you know, a five, six, five, seven, like chubby kid with sports goggles. Like I wore glasses when mm-hmm. I was younger. And I just saw how, you know, he maneuvered around campus. Even before I was there, just just watching how how he carried himself, you know, it made me really check myself and thinking that, you know, I need to pretty much up my game if I'm going to go into this world. I can't do the same stuff I've been doing and expecting different results. So South Central and Beverly Hills, two of the most (laughs) famous neighborhoods in the country, also probably two of the most different neighborhoods in the whole (laughs) country. Yeah. What was that like? Like, You know, I studied sociology and they talk about code switching. Mm -hmm. You'd kind of live one way with one group of people (laughs) and then in a different part of your day, live another way with different people. Did it feel like you were living in two different worlds? What was that like for you? Yeah, it's it's interesting because um, obviously over the, over the past like year and a half, I, I really had to unpack some of these memories. But, you know, it was, you know how they say people have a work voice and just like a work life. Like I had a legit school life that was different from my home life. Not not to say that I was doing anything bad or or whatnot, but I have friends that I went to school with a, like a prince of Indonesia who would throw these lavish parties at the end of football games where he bought a piece of Toontown from Disneyland and put it in his backyard. It was like a tree house in his backyard that I remember like walking through it, like, wait, I've been here before. Like, what is going on? He's like, he's like <laughs> oh yeah, like we, you know, they're doing reconstruction at Disneyland. So we just bought this house and put it in our backyard. I'm like, this doesn't happen where I'm from. Right, just the height of excess. So what's it like then going to that birthday party and then going back to South Central? As a, as a teenager, as a 13, 14-year-old teenager, still trying to figure out, you know, where you are in this world, where's your place in this world, you know, there was some good and bad that came from it. It undoubtedly made me realize, you know, technically what I didn't have in this world or what I, you know, what I wanted or what I wanted to strive for, you know, I, again, I never thought I was poor growing up, but being thrusted into Beverly Hills High School, you're seeing kids roll up with $100,000 Mercedes Benz as their, you know, sweet 16. Whoa. Birthday gift. Like even, there were a few people from my high school that was, they were on MTV sweet 16. Uh-huh. And I remember it like, oh, I like, yeah, I have fifth period with her. And, you know, I had a 92 Honda Accord. Like I had to draw, I had to keep a gallon of water in my trunk just to keep it from overheating, you know? So there's, there's little things like that that would remind you that, you know, it's not as bad, the, like the, the process of assimilating into that culture. It, there were definitely some ups and downs, but, you know, honestly, looking back on it, again, it just allowed me to, at a younger age, kind of carve out what I wanted out of this life because I, I saw the good and bad that came with Beverly Hills High School. What was some of the good that you saw with it? You know, I, I saw a sense of drive in some, in some students that I don't think I saw uh, growing up in my area where 13 or 14 year old kids are already thinking about college, are already thinking about how they can, you know, take over their parents' business, how they could, you know, start their own business. I had friends that started their own businesses in, in sophomore year, freshman year of high school. And it came from that entrepreneurial spirit that their parents had when those, when their parents came over from the various places they were from. And, you know, sometimes living in Los Angeles, the people over there, they, you know, they want more, but sometimes the resources aren't as available to us. And we can't really see the grass on the other side because we're too busy worrying about the stuff that we don't have or the stuff that we're trying to get, you know, like the, there's a lot of micro thinking that goes on in South Central that I think we need to get past. At the time I was going to middle school in Inglewood and all my friends were going to Inglewood. They were going to Culver City. I was the only kid I knew that was going to go to Beverly Hills High School. So I didn't have any friends. I, I was going to be a complete outlier. But my parents was like, you have to go there. There's no other, there's no other opportunity for you to go anywhere else. We're making you go there. And to this day, I credit them because, you know, it allowed going to Beverly Hills High School allowed me to see the world through different lens, allowed me to be comfortable in any room I sit in. And just have empathy towards other races, other cultures. And to me, it was the best decision my parents ever made for me. So how did you go about creating your own results and creating your own place and your sense of belonging? So 
I took it upon myself to kind of, you know, assimilate into the culture of Beverly Hills. Now, in the Black community, the idea of assimilation is technically a negative concept for us because for us, it's always tied towards something like gentrification or, you know, just taking out the old and replacing it with something that you think is better. Right. The act of adopting something new, people think that you have to give up something like a one in one out kind of a thing versus thinking of it as additive where you can retain who you are, but also add on another area of your identity. Absolutely. And I, and I caught a lot of slack for that, you know, seventh and eighth grade when, you know, again, I went to school in Inglewood when my friends finally realized that, oh, you're not going to go to school with us. We're not going to all play for Inglewood High School, play for Culver City High School. You're going to Beverly Hills. So you're going to go be with our rival. Mm-hmm. So you're going to assimilate. You're going to think you're better than us. You're going to think that, you know, you have better opportunities than us and you're going to forget about us when really I wanted nothing more than to keep the balance between both worlds. But I absolutely had some friends that saw me as somebody that thought I was going to just walk away from them and live a better life than them and just kind of put myself on a pedestal when that couldn't be further from the truth. So unfortunately, I have lost their head full of friends from them not getting out of their own mind towards, you know, stuff that I was doing back then. Mm. When did you first realize that with football, you had a chance to play at the next level? (laughs) I I actually, I do remember going into my junior year, I had grown eight or nine inches or so within, within a four to five month span. I was on varsity now and coming at halftime, my uncle said, you know, stuff's not working. We're going to start throwing you the ball. I said, okay, you know, let's do it. And just slowly but surely, I started getting the ball more, started making more plays. And I, I played on defense just because that's what you do in high school. You go both ways. But I went to a Cal versus UCLA game uh, my junior year. And my uncle, who's well-connected within the college circuit, he was talking to some of the coaches there because they, they go way back. And I overhear him saying, man, who's this kid? Who's this pacing your kid with X amount of yards and X amount of touchdowns? And I remember like it was yesterday, my uncle like smiles and he looks at me and points at me like, oh yeah, that's Spencer. That's my nephew. And I try not to look because I was trying to play it cool. You know, I was, I was a cool guy back then. <laughs> yeah. But I remember thinking, and it was a UCLA coach. And I remember hearing him say like, oh, you know, he'll be hearing from us. And that was the first moment I thought, wow, I can go somewhere with this. I didn't know exactly where. I didn't have a favorite school at that point. But I knew that if I just kept putting in the work, you know, good things were going to happen. So it just gave me that drive. And where did you end up going? I went to the University of Oregon. So it's, a, it's funny how I ended up there. Uh, I was actually committed to University of Colorado for about two weeks. Really? Yeah. So Oregon was my only defensive offer. All my other offers were to play receiver. I, I, I was primarily a receiver in high school. I was a league MVP, all CIF. Like I was a, I was a pretty good receiver in high school. But when I went on my trip to Oregon, I loved it. I loved everything about it. And I said, you know, I called my dad that moment. I said, hey, I think I'm going to commit here. He said, okay, great. So they said, hey, we know what you can do at receiver, but there's a chance you might switch to defense because we've seen some of your defensive tape and we, we kind of like it. That was a really interesting choice, though, because, well, first, it's really rare to be able to excel in two different positions, an offensive and a defensive, and be recruited for both. But based on how many uh, colleges recruiting you for offense, it sounds like you were a bit better, at least at that point, you know, as an offensive player. So what do you think drew you to like signing up for the one school who wanted you to play defense? Well, I mean, this kind of goes back to my to my uncle and my dad is, you know, during this whole conversation of where to go. Colorado would have played receiver, but they said, would you rather be a possession receiver in that conference or a fast linebacker or safety in the Pac-10? And mind you, this is the this is the era of Matt Leinart, of Reggie Bush, of Marshawn Lynch, Deshaun Jackson. The Pac-10 for me was godly. Mm-hmm. So I said, I'll play any position just to play in the Pac-10. So you're playing in the Premier League uh, for a Premier team mm-hmm. in, in Oregon. And in 2011, you made it to the BCS National Championship game, yeah. Oregon versus Auburn, and you lost on a field goal as time expired. Yeah. What was that moment like for you? You know, that was such an interesting time because I don't think I really took in, fully took in the magnitude of playing in the national championship. Like, 
a lot of people don't know this, but I actually was going to walk away from football after my redshirt junior year. So I had already graduated. I had a job offer in Portland. We had just lost in the Rose Bowl to, uh, to Ohio State. So I'm thinking, like, I just played in the granddaddy of them all, had a great career. You know, this program's on the rise. But, you know, I have an opportunity to go up to Portland to start work early to earn, like, actually a pretty good ra- uh, wage out of college. What's stopping me from doing this? So you were going to just say, okay, football's been great for me. It's been a great vehicle. Pay for my education. I'm ready to join corporate America. Yeah, absolutely. So my my mentor, shout out to James Harris. He was like one of the most influential guys in my life. And he kind of looked at me and said like, there's something different about you. So what, like, I'm going to get you internships. I'm going to get you job opportunities. in in Eugene, Oregon, so you can plug into the business of Eugene, Oregon. So from like sophomore year, every off season, I was doing uh, internships. I was doing job shadowing experiences, just really building out my resume, my resume, something that like certain college athletes just aren't exposed to. So I had done enough to where a pretty prominent company in Portland, they offered me a job and I was highly considering it to the point where I was at peace with walking away from football. Like at this time, I didn't think I was going to play in the NFL. Like I thought I was a, a decent linebacker on a good team. My two roommates, uh, Brian Butterfield and Chad Peppers, they were just like, listen, you can't leave. Like, we all came in here the same year. Let's all go out the same year. Let's all just be together. This is our last year. You can't leave early. So I I, I remember saying, all right. We already made it to the Rose Bowl. If I'm coming back, like we at least got to go to a national championship. So, I mean, that was just kind of the thing. Like, so the thing it sounds like that drove you back was the camaraderie and the bond with your teammates. Absolutely. It's the, the thing about the locker room, the thing about the bond that players have that are that make up that community is unlike anything else in the world. So when my guys came to me and said, you can't leave, you know, I, I took that to heart. I said, well, if, if I'm to stay, then... We at least got to go to the national championship as a joke, saying it as a joke, like, you know, what, ha- like we have a pretty good team, but I'm not exactly thinking we're going to make it to the national championship, you know? <laughs> right. So you just wanted to raise the bar and like, what's bigger than the Rose Bowl? Okay. National championship. Absolutely. And, and the thing that even made me say that was as soon as Chip Kelly took over, because his first year there, he was an offensive coordinator and completely revamped how we played football. As soon as he took over the year later as a head coach, Casey Matthews, my linebacker, my homeboy, we played together. We started together for three years. He said, just in passing, he goes, oh, we're going to win the, you know, we're going to get to the Rose Bowl, like, I mean, Pac-10 champions. Chip looked at him and said, yeah, that's great, but I'm trying to get a national championship. And he, Chip walked away, and that was the first time we really heard that. And Casey looked at me and was like, I like this guy. You know, like he, yeah, he has it. He, he knows how to get us there. And two years later, we were there. So you described yourself as a good linebacker playing on a great team. (laughs) When you were considering walking away, nowhere on your radar was playing on the NFL. You're ready to take a job in corporate America. The season ends on the heartbreaker in the national championship. You go undrafted. Mm -hmm. How in the heck did you end up playing for the New York Giants? I mean, honestly, we can take it all the way back to that field goal. Uh, in the national championship game when I, I never saw the field goal go in. I just knew that if their side of the line was celebrating, we had just lost the national championship. And if we were celebrating, we had just won. So when I saw their team celebrating, I just walked off the field. And I know I, I had tears. I was trying to fight them back. But, you know, it was it was something like, man, this part of my life is over. Because I had already moved my stuff out of Oregon back here to Los Angeles because after that game, technically my my ties with Oregon are done. Um, so I moved back, moved into my grandfather's house, into his spare bedroom, and I started training out in Redondo Beach. So for going on three and a half to four months, I had no idea what was going to happen. I didn't know if I was going to get a shot. I didn't know if any team, you know, was high on me or low on me. Like working out every day at, at my high school for an uncertain future. I didn't know what was going to happen. It's just complete radio silence. So I'm just like scraping by, just attempting to keep my head above water. And I'm driving down La Cienega Boulevard, heading to work out that morning. My dad texts me. He goes, 
ESPN saying the lockout might be over any minute. I'm like, oh, okay, that's great. Like, hope I hope a team will call me. Five minutes later, my phone starts blowing up. I pull over to the side of the road. The Cardinals called me, and I remember talking to Arizona, and they were like, we're really high on you. We want you to come out. I said, great. Like, this is close to home. I can get to and from L.A. if I need to. My family can come out once or twice for a game. Excuse me, sir, do you mind if I just call my parents real quick? Just tell them, like, I, I'm, I want to. I just, you know, I just want to call my parents. Okay, great. You know, calls back. Call my parents. Hey, mom, I'm going to go to, to the Cardinals. Great. Cool. Call them back. Sorry, the position has been filled. What? Two minutes later. Like, no no bullshit. Two minutes later, I called them back. Hey, the position has been filled. Sorry, best of luck out there. So the Giants called me. This 30-second conversation is why I ended up with the Giants. And it was, Spencer, uh, we know we didn't draft you. We were hiring on you. You know, we know what you can do on the field. We think you can do some special things. We know you're probably getting interest from other teams, but we would love to have you here if possible. We'd just love to have you here. Just like literally just for a tryout. Thinking, you know what? I just had a terrible experience. I just like got kicked to the curb by, Car- I mean, by uh, the Cardinals. I want to sign with you guys. And as a kid from LA, I'm already thinking, man, I've already done it in LA. Let's go see what the Big Apple is about. It's a challenge. Like, let me go to, let me go to the Big Apple and see if I can make a name for myself. Hmm. And that's how I ended up. And so what was your role on that team as a rookie in your NFL season? <laughs> Mainly special teams. I was, I was a special teams uh, a demon at that time where it was interesting because, you know, as a rookie, you're just kind of a chicken with your head cut off, just trying to just figure it out. We knew this is what we were going to do and we were going to be dogs at it. And we did it. So you go from in college, almost not being on the team to then being in the national championship game, the ball flying through the air. Uh, that's going to determine the fate of the game. You know, it goes through the uprights and you lose. Yeah. Now, fast forward one year later, you're almost not on this New York Giants team. Yep. Uh, you somehow find your way onto the team. And one year later, you're playing in the Super Bowl. Yeah. So it's Super Bowl 46, Giants versus Patriots, mm-hmm. the underdog team, mm-hmm. you know, Eli Manning versus Tom Brady. And it also comes down to the last play. Yes. So we, this is insane. <laughs> well, I mean, come on. If our side is screaming, we just won the Super Bowl. If their side is screaming, we just lost the Super Bowl. And I did not see the play happen because I was sitting with another uh, rookie linebacker, Greg Jones, on the sideline. And I was like, Greg, I can't watch this play right now. I'm too nerd. Like, but I just knew everybody around me started screaming. And that's when I looked up, saw the score, and I ran on the field like, a bat out of hell. <laughs> just running around, jumping, screaming, chest bumping everybody, like top of the world, because I just lost a national championship. I'd gone undrafted. I just had every emotion just pouring out of me. And somehow, some way, my dad and my brother got onto the field, like really quick, actually. I don't know if they like hopped the fence or <laughs> something. So I knew they had passes to get on the field, but they got on the field really quick, but I just remember seeing my seeing my older brother and running to him, and I just started bawling. I just started mm. crying my eyes out because it was just like so much weight had been lifted off my shoulders, and I never thought I would even be here. But this is is this is a dream that I've had since I was a kid, just to be to play in the biggest game, to contribute in the biggest game, and like ultimately come away with a win. All those emotions just poured out of me at once, man. You are like a scratch and claw underdog guy. I mean, this at every level to get to the next level, you went through a really similar thing where, you know, going into high school, you were supposed to go to Beverly Hills High School, but it sounds like some pieces needed to line up for you to, to go there. Yeah. And you get there and there are better players than you, but through a few years, you eventually kind of find your way and become noticed and play well enough to get recruited by some some top universities. But then the one you want to go to, Oregon, <laughs> says, well, maybe, and we'll see, and they kind of put you on hold, yeah. and you almost don't end up at Oregon. Yeah. And then you get to Oregon, you say you're a good player on a great team, <laughs> but then you almost walk away from football altogether after your junior year. You come back one more year with the lofty goal of national champion. You make it to the game. You lose on a heartbreaker you start to think about, well, man, maybe I can go to the NFL. Yeah. But then you go undrafted. Yeah. Then you claw and scratch your way onto an NFL roster. 
And then you make it to the Super Bowl as a rookie and you win. You make me sound amazing, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it is amazing. This is ridiculous. This doesn't happen in real life. I mean, for, for me, it's just about doing the work. It's about like going back to college, going even back to, to high school. I would never really sit and waste time thinking, man, the, the what if, like, man, if I can just get to this school or in college, if I can just get to the NFL, it was, I have workouts to do. So let me just do the workout, you know, as best as I can. Oh, I have school. Let me just see how good of grades I can get. Like I was an econ major at Oregon. Like those classes were hard, but you know, it, it just, it taught me, just my experience was it was just do the work, just do the work, be accountable. It's not flashy. It's not, you don't know if it's going to bring you re like immediate rewards, but if you put your head down and do it, good things will come. You know, the average NFL career is three years. Yes. You played for seven. And, you know, I've talked to a lot of pro athletes and usually uh, what I hear is, well, my goal is to play 10 years or in some sports, maybe they have more longevity than football, like NBA players. Oh, my goal is to play, you know, 15 years or something like that. I read something that really surprised me about you. You had a stated goal to be out of the NFL and retired by age 30. Yes. Yes. Why the goal to say, I am going to end my career by this point? Well, back then, and it, this kind of plays into like me walking away from football, almost walking away from football in college, where I knew from a young age, football was going to be finite for me. I still don't think football will be the biggest thing in my life. I just, I've always had that mindset. So where do you think that belief came from? I, I don't know. I, I, I can't put a finger on it, but I just know that I've seen players who are amazing on the field, who are gods on the field, who are in the Hall of Fame right now. And when you talk to them, they can't step away from the game, even though technically they did 15, 20 years, even like five or six years ago. So I never want to be that guy that, you know, is still living off of past achievements. Like even when I got my Super Bowl ring, I think I wore it to two or three events and then I gave it to my grandfather for safekeeping. I said, hey, I don't need this in my house. I don't need to see this every day. I don't need to wear it every day. Like I had some friends that would wear it to go to the grocery store, to go pay bills and whatnot. I don't like that. It sounds crazy to me, but I don't know where that mindset came of, of just, I wanted to dedicate my 20s to playing football. I was young enough to do it. My body, I was a spring chicken back when I was 21, 22 years old. But I knew that I didn't want to become a casualty of the game, as I say, where this, the NFL, like, they, they can't wait to forget about you. Like, it's the first day that you're there, they're already looking for your replacement. Mind you, I didn't want to put all my, my heart and effort into it, which I did. I'm not saying that in, a, in a terms of, like, slacking off on the field. But I knew that I can have a long career in the NFL, which I did. I was able to play my seven years and get out four months before, uh, six months before I turned 30. But I didn't want that to dictate the rest of my life. I didn't want to be 35, 40, 50 years old still talking about the good old days on Twitter. You know, oh, look at us back then. Because I, I see that and I don't see much else from some of these people. And I know that some of these guys are having problems just stepping away from the game. And it was kind of like a cautionary tale to me. I just did not want to be that person. Yeah, well, we talk about change and and how do you reinvent your identity a lot on this podcast? And and one thing, and we don't really know each other. This is essentially the first conversation we've ever had. But one of the things that's striking me about you is how much you enjoy a challenge. And I think to to live in the past in that way would sort of be antithetical to to who you are. Yeah. Like to live in the past would just be at odds with who you are as a person, because if you're only looking backwards, then where's the challenge to overcome? Absolutely. Absolutely. So when did you start to think, you know, you put down the kind of gauntlet of, okay, by age 30, I'm out. To say that and to do that are two different things. When you have the opportunity to continue playing, which I believe you did, mm -hmm. to actually do it, to actually walk away, how did you get actually rooted in this decision and, and see it through? I, it just, it kind of goes back to that idea of accepting a new challenge for what it is and, and not making it any bigger or smaller than what it is. Like 
before I do something, I have to commit to the details of it. I have to know exactly what I'm doing before I do it. Again, going back to James Harris, who, who taught me that whole, you can do something in the off season. You don't have to just lay on a beach or just, you know, do anything you want. Like do something to further your career off the field. So after my first, I think like two or three years in the league, I was just kind of excited, you know, just, you know, going on vacations and, and, you know, living different parts of LA to kind of see where I would want to live one day and just kind of exploring the whole lavish life of the NFL. But by that like third year or so, I started thinking like, okay, what can I do now? You know, that's, you know, that can parallel with this. So, you know, I talked to the Giants and we ended up finding a slew of internships for myself and just kind of plugging myself into the business side of the New York Giants. So I've done job shouting experience. I've done uh, like business combines during my time with the Dolphins. I've done full on internships, like immersive in like, you know, meeting deadlines and the whole work emails and all the crazy stuff that comes with it. But yeah, like my third or fourth year, that's when I started to think, you know, football can't be it and I won't let it be it. So now it's time to, to see what else is out there. And so when did you know that that was it for football? Do you remember who was the person you told first when you were going to follow through with your commitment to stop playing football by age 30? Um, I mean, this, by this time I was married uh, to my wife, uh, Blair Pacinger. You know, we, we're very open in our relationship. We're very like, I'm able to talk about thoughts and feelings and emotions with her and, and planning it. And she allows me to sort of drive the family in direction that I see is best for us. So a lot, a, a common theme in the NFL is once you get to year five, that's some people like toughest year, just mentally, because the whole, this shiny new toy, you know, the polish sort of rubbed off. You're in the dog days of it. Your body's just not what it used to be. And you start having those thoughts of what's next. You know, I might be done with this. My mind's not as committed as it used to be, although I want it to be. I talked to a therapist. I forget her name. But at this time, I, was, I just had a lot to unpack. Um, mm-hmm. Deciding if I want to stay with this dream or potentially walk away, whatnot. And telling her that lofty goal that I had of playing time 30. And when I told her that, she looked at me crazy. She was just like, man, do you know how much pressure you put on yourself as a 22-year-old undrafted rookie to demand that you play until you're 30? Like, some people you're in your position don't play two games, let alone seven years in the league. Like, you need to take a moment to realize everything that you've done in the past. And another mentor of mine, Chad Williams, he talks about if you're always looking at the horizon, you know, you rarely look back at the buoys that you placed. So a lot of us, just, we're always looking forward. We're always looking forward and like what we don't have. But once you look behind, you see everything that you've done, that gives you sort of solace and confidence that, yes, you can still go forward. So it was just that mindset of like, just take a look behind you and, and see everything that you've done and have that power you towards, towards your mission instead of looking at it as if it's so much further to go. So tell me about how you did go about getting into your something else, because you've got something big in the works. <laughs> yeah. You know, we're sitting here having this conversation. It's only six, seven months after, you know, the last time you you wore an NFL jersey. Yeah. And you already have this huge thing that you're embarking upon. So how did the, first of all, like, let's, uh, I'm dying to talk about this. By all means. Please share uh, about the television show that is is in the works. I have a TV show coming out uh, October 10th on the CW called All American. It's a show that's loosely based off of my upbringing of growing up in South Central and going to Beverly Hills High School. Uh, the story, again, is loosely based off of myself. Obviously, they they take liberties with, with the storytelling. So it's not, you know, word for word, scene for scene, what I went through. But this all started about two years ago, I want to say where coming into the league that, you know, in 2011, the first off day I had on the Giants, I was just, my mind was just heavy. I had so much information. We were learning 10 to 15 new defenses a day, like there from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. at night. 
And I thought, man, I just want to go somewhere and forget about football, forget about everything and just be away. So I went to a movie theater that was right near uh, the stadium. And I think I watched about three movies that day. And I, it, I remember because I didn't think about football once. And even when I left that last movie, I was like, oh man, I got to go back to football now. So I kind of use that as my therapy. Uh, so every Tuesday in the league for seven years, I would essentially go to the movie theater, just getting that feel of falling into a story and seeing where it goes. So your escape became watching movies. Yes. I had lo- I've loved movies my whole life. So how did you go from being a fan of movies and a fan of, you know, kind of visual storytelling to then making the shift of, I want to make this because I like music a lot and I've never once had the thought I should be a music producer. How did you become a television show producer? This kind of goes back to doing the work. Like I, like I talk about where at one point I was watching the movie and I just started, I knew what was going to happen. I'm like, okay, he's going to die. This is going to happen. She might get cancer. Like, you know, just like, like literally projecting the movie before it happened. Right, like play recognition. Exactly. Uh, playing defense where exactly. you, you sort of like, okay, I've seen this before. Like this is going to happen. You see it before it unfolds. You know, calling out the movies before they happen. I thought, man, I'm, I'm getting good at this. Like, let me see if I can write my own stories, you know? So I downloaded a Final Draft Writer and kind of started plugging away at stories that I thought would be cool to tell. Stories from my life, like just being in the locker room. And uh, a lot of people don't know this, but a like literally hundreds of thousands of movies, the PDF version is online. So you can just type in Pineapple Express PDF and the script will come up and you can literally read how the movie was written. So now I'm watching movies and I'm thinking, man, how was that written? How was that long pause right there written? How was, okay, now he's looking out the window. Oh, okay, Seth Rogen goes into James Franco's apartment and he's like freaking out that they're coming to get him. Like, how was that frantic part written so I would go online and I would look at it and I just kind of like take note, mental notes, take some notes in my, in my notebook. Did that feel familiar to you from like watching a game film and having <laughs> yeah. the playbook on your lap? Yeah. You could sort of see what was going on behind what was going on. After, after a while, when I started watching movies and seeing how certain things played out, I'm like, okay, there was a period right there. Okay. This is a transition. Oh, okay. This is an intercut. This is what an intercut is. So literally watching a movie, still having the joy of being, you know, away from football in my mind, but now dissecting it with my football mind. So again, I just started like plugging away and, and writing my own stuff. And a good friend of mine, Gala said, oh, I know you're, you said you're writing some stuff now. That's pretty cool. My roommate sells in the unscripted space. Maybe like you guys should meet sometime. The 2016 season on my bye week, I came back home and just one night went over to their house met Dane, and we realized that we actually played for rival high schools. When I was at Beverly, he went to Peninsula High School. We we were talking about my perception of Peninsula, his perception of Beverly Hills, and just really like conversation. So he sits, he sits there and he goes, man, how was it? How was it growing up in Beverly Hills? And I go, I've been asked this question a million times. I'm like, oh, I didn't grow up in Beverly Hills. I grew up in South Central. I just commuted every day. And he sits there, he goes, huh. He would ask and just giving him pops of my experience growing up. Coming from the other side of the tr- proverbial tracks, yeah. going to the Beverly Hills High School, there's a lot of drama built into that. So then did they encourage you to keep writing? Or what happened? What was the next step? Like, how did, how did this idea, uh, you know, where you're writing about your life and your experience, how did it become a greenlit TV show? So we, once I got back from the season, we all met. Me, Dane, and Robbie at a coffee shop in Culver City. And they were just like, you know, tell us a couple of stories of both sides of the track. Like, what did you actually go through? And I told them stuff that for me was normal. It was my, it was my reality of my mom telling me as a teenager, don't drive in this neighborhood at past 11 o'clock. Just go sleep at your grandmother's house because, you know, things can happen. Don't get gas past 10 o'clock. Always stay in the middle lane. Uh, if you're approaching, if people are approaching you, Look and see where their hands are. If their hands are in their jackets or their pockets, they, there's a chance they might have something. These little cues of growing up that you in South Central that you just pick up without even really knowing that, you know, psychologically what it's doing to you. And then on South Central, I mean, uh, in Beverly Hills, it's having kids that had heroin addictions when they were 15 years old. Um, going to, again, the Prince of Indonesia, his house for a party 
that has Toontown uh, structures in the backyard and just kind of showing them both sides of the track. So after- right, it's like the dark side of having too much and then the dark side of having too little. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, I was telling them because they were sort of under the impression that, oh, so you escaped South Central. I said, no, I didn't. I never escaped South Central and Beverly didn't save me. Beverly just exposed me to a whole new world of like problems that people in my area, you know, we don't experience. Like, so after having this conversation, Robbie said, you know, at the time he was dating a big TV producer, uh, they're now married, uh, Greg Berlanti. And he goes, you know what? I think I want to like bring this to Greg. Do you want to write like a one page something mm-hmm. that can I can give to him and see if he likes it or not? I read that he was uh, a producer and a writer of Dawson's Creek. So he was a producer and writer of Dawson's Creek at like, I think he was like 25 years old, actually. He's the showrunner for Arrow, The Flash, Black Lightning, Riverdale. Uh, he has the record right now for most TV shows on air at once. At like, I think he's up to like 15 now. Like he is like the biggest swell in the ocean, essentially. So I said, yeah. Like, and that's, what, that's how it came about is I, I wrote a one page, like, a, like honestly, like a paragraph of the idea of a, a kid from South Central going to Beverly Hills and ending it with the biggest game of my life wasn't between chalked white lines. It was actually navigating both sides of the tracks of Los Angeles, something along that line. And they loved it. it Greg read it, then it went up to his boss, to his boss, to his boss. And that ended up leading to a meeting with Warner Brothers where I was essentially telling them the same stories and stuff that I told Dana and Robbie at the coffee shop. Wow. So I mean, we're in LA right now. Every bartender has a script in their back pocket. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's got an idea for a great movie or a great TV show. Dude, yours is getting made. Yeah. You were in the NFL nine months ago. <laughs> like, what is going on? I don't know, man. I'm still trying to figure it out. Like, this is my first anything in Hollywood. Like, again, I was writing my own stuff, but that was just a hobby. That was just something to get my mind away. Another avenue to get my mind away from football to allow itself to heal and to just be creative. Like that was my creative outlet. But people ask me like, man, how does it feel to, to have this TV show going on the air? And even before, even before it was hitting certain marks that, you know, kind of insinuated that it would be a TV show and, you know, build as one of the best TV shows coming up this fall. I was like, I don't know how to feel because I don't have a baseline for this. Like, this doesn't happen. I don't know somebody that I can talk to where this happens. And especially for it to be attached to somebody like Greg Berlanti, where, you know, when I first met him, I didn't know how big he was. But every time I talk about this project with somebody, they'll hit me with the, oh, that's nice. You know, oh, you have a T, oh, you have a project. Oh, that's cool. And I go, Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, Greg Berlanti's attached to it. And they go, wait, Greg? Wait, Greg Berlanti, do you know how big he is, right? He's the biggest. He's a monarch in this industry. And that's what kind of made me realize, whoa, this is, if this wants to go somewhere, I'm with the right person to to take it. So, and maybe part of it is because everyone in LA has some project and people are used to just saying, oh, that's nice and kind of giving you a pat on the head and, you know, let's keep it moving. But what have you experienced in terms of people's preconceived notions of you as an NFL player mm-hmm. now stepping into the entertainment industry? One thing that I've had to deal with is the idea of this pedestal that whether I want to be on it or not, I'm there. And having people, having conversations with people to tell them, hey, take me down from whatever idea you have built up in your head about me. So, Going into this project, you know, there were times where you know, I wasn't getting certain information that I should have been getting or just not having a full scope of stuff to come. Take you down because you wanted to be involved and just treated like one of the team? Absolutely. Like, I'll go grab coffee if you if somebody needs coffee. Hey, what kind do you want? I'll run around, around the corner and get it. Like, again, it goes back to doing the work. I don't want, from the first day, I didn't come in there saying, I'm an NFL athlete. You need to respect me. This is my story. No, I allowed them to take the story. I told them a bunch of different, you know, memories and stuff of the past. I said, no, take this and do what you want. I would love to just be a part of the project. 
And thank goodness I am. But there, at the beginning of it, there were certain times where there was sort of a wall between me and certain people because they just deemed me as, oh, you you probably have so much other stuff to worry about. So we'll do this and then you can pop in, pop out whenever you want. And I'm like, listen, this is the most important thing in my life outside of my family. Like all, even when I was still playing football, cause I knew I was almost done. So I'm like, I want to be here as much as I can. I want to help out as much as I can. I'll grab coffee. I'll do the notes in the room. Like I just want to be in the room because at this point I really started to think like, man, I love this stuff. I love creating. I love writing. I love storytelling. Like, this is what I want to do. So to have the first project is insane. I just wanted to soak up as much information as I could, but I did have to have conversations with people to tell them, to tell them effectively, like remove any assumptions you have about me and let's build a actual working relationship. Not this NFL player consultant coming in, popping in with everyone. He probably has more stuff to worry about. Like, no, I'm here. I'm here and I'm here to do the work. Right. And in reinventing yourself from NFL player to television show producer, there's actually a double challenge. (laughs) There's breaking out of the box that you've been comfortable living in. Yes. But then there's also breaking out of the box that others put you in. Yes. Right. So you're working kind of those two of those things at once uh, with that challenge. It's weird because I'm at, I was thinking about this the other day. I'm at that intersection of enjoying my retirement from football while simultaneously attempting to do the grunt work and build up my rapport in TV and film production. So there are some days where I'm like, man, I'm going to lay on the couch and I'm going to eat anything I want and I'm going to watch all the movies I want to watch. And then the next day I have a schedule from like 6 a.m. to like 2 a.m., like full on schedule of shooting, being on set, helping in the writer's room or what have you. So it's it's this weird dynamic of just trying to find the balance again of these two completely different entities. Right. And there's a striking parallel between the world you're in now in television production, being a production consultant, right? You're one of, what, five credited producers yeah. on the show and kind of part of that producer team. But you're started off basically as the undrafted uh, player, <laughs> yeah. right? Where you're kind of, you're, you're walking onto the team trying to prove to people that you can do it. You're in this, <laughs> might feel like a familiar role right now. It is, it is. And, you know, it's weird because I'm, I'm coming in with seemingly more clout than I've ever had entering into a, a new industry where, you know, I have the the tagline of NFL player and Super Bowl champion and seven year vet and what, and a couple other things that I've been doing. But, you know, for this, this just goes back to, you know, just honing in on what the, what the job is and where can I contribute? Like being a consulting producer for the, for the project, I have the opportunity to kind of dive into a few different sectors of what makes the show go where One day I could be on set all day, like standing behind the director, seeing how they're framing a shot. The next day I could be in the writer's room helping out, you know, you know, finish out stories and give my perspective on how I would react in certain situations for the character. So there there are times I'm literally floating between uh, different things. But if you're looking at me, you don't want to look at me as a casualty. Or if I'm walking into the room, you don't want to roll your eyes and say, oh, he's here. Like, what is he going to contribute? Like, I want to be able to walk into a room and say, you know, people perk up and say, oh, like, we're going to get some good stuff from him because he's here to learn. He's here to work. He's not, you know, throwing his tags around saying, this is who I am. You need to respect me. Right. I'm so excited for you and in entering into this, uh, into this new realm. And now that you've had a taste of Hollywood mm-hmm. and an opportunity to tell your story and be part of the creative process and be part of the production process, do you think I hope the show runs for a long time for you, my friend. Do you think that you'll look for other entertainment projects to put into the world? Yeah, absolutely. So at this current time, me and Dane Mork, we've kind of, we've kind of become a tandem, um, just working on a bunch of different things together where by all means, this is just the beginning, I hope. And in doing some research, I understand that you're active outside of the entertainment realm as well. Mm -hmm. Tell me about After Ball. After Ball is a small fund that I came up with last year. An investment fund. Investment fund with a few other NFL athletes. So I'm in a, I'm in a group chat with 
it's it's upwards of about 20 NFL athletes. I know even a uh, good friend, Ryan Mundy's in it as well. Right, previous big jump guest. Yeah. Yeah. And like, literally all we do is in this group chat, we talk tech ideas, opportunities. We send each other uh, decks. Uh, we plug each other with different like, industry leaders and just kind of curating this this atmosphere of entrepreneurship, investments, um, some really big name, Russell Okun is in it, Kelvin Beecham, a slew of players. So how did this group of you guys get started? how did this chat room get started? I don't know how it got started, but I just one day, Brian Mundy texted me and said, hey, do you like you know investments in tech and stuff and tech? I go, yeah. He goes, all right, I'm adding you to a group chat. And I see like 12 different decks from all these companies and stuff. So I I started taking deep dives into these companies and seeing like, oh, what's make what make like how much did they raise? What's making them tick? What are their the competition? All this stuff. And you know, I'm thinking about putting some money in. I said, me too. Well, why don't we do this together? So I took the initiative and created LLC after ball LLC and a few guys part of that group chat. Um, we've since added like I think two other guys, and we just have this small fund uh, by NFL athletes that are investing in tech startups. That's really cool. It's almost in the way that you would go to a movie theater and immerse yourself in film and try to figure out what was going on. This group chat is kind of that for you where you've got pitch decks flying around and term sheets and you're sort of watching it go by and diving in and, and kind of figuring out the rules to this other new game. Yeah, absolutely. And even like, like building up how I vet deals now, like I send it to the group chat. I send it to like various mentors that are in this space that are actively, you know, doing this on both sides of the investment space and getting to a conclusion if I decide to uh, invest or bring it to the group to invest collectively or pass on it. It's it's an ongoing uh, education, but it's exciting. It's something that I think more athletes beyond the NFL should look to and and before before actually diving into it, definitely do your homework because there are some sharks out there. There, there are people that will show you the, the best deck in the world and the specs and everything behind it, and it turns out to be a sham. So, again, I'm still doing my homework. I'm still learning. I'm, I've actually learned a lot from Ryan Mundy. He's, like, probably the smartest guy, one of the smartest guys in the group chat. But, um, yeah, it's just, you know, it's just fun that we're working on, actively just trying to build it and, and just become a, a mainstay in the NFL. Well, beyond the NFL. Right. That's great. That's great. I love that you guys are doing that. Um, so to kind of wind it down here a bit, you know, yeah. the cool down after the workout, <laughs> um, just have a couple more for you. So um, I'm curious about what aspect of yourself are you currently working on? Again, I'm, I'm working on not being uh, as hard on myself. Uh, sometimes I, I put a crazy amount of pressure on myself to do certain things where, you know, there's certain things that don't need a deadline. You just need to actively work towards reaching that goal for yourself. And I'm the type of person that goes, oh, I need to be better by this day. I need to, you know, last week I felt better. This week I don't feel as good. So that means I'm, you know, I'm going downhill. I need to get back up essentially. So I'm, I'm actively working on like not putting as much pressure on myself. I think that's that's the biggest, there's a bunch of things, but mm-hmm. that's the biggest thing. That I think that ties into a bunch of other things. Yeah, being a person such as yourself that is driven by a challenge, yeah. um, there's a double-edged sword to it where it's great and it's it can be helpful in pursuing new things, mm-hmm. but also there can be a pressure that's created from it. And it sounds like, you know, I've, I've gone through that stuff as well um, with, you know, catching myself and how much pressure I'm putting on and I coming you're pulling back from it and realizing, wait a minute, dude, like you're the one who's creating this situation, right? Like it's my own expectation that who knows where I even invented the expectation from. And now I'm beating myself up for not living up to my own invented standard. Uh, and like, you know, kind of the, the struggle that comes from that is it was self-invented in, in a lot of areas. So I'm working on getting better at catching that for me. And so that's like the downside to being a person who's driven by a challenge. The upside is you live a big full life Mm -hmm. and you do get to accomplish a lot of things that hard work and uh, meaning and and fulfillment sometimes goes into. So I can see how that goes. Yeah. And I I mean, even now I'm, I'm sort of dealing with that, that mindset of placing these lofty goals on myself and 
you know, feeling that anxiety and that pressure that I put on myself to succeed because in my head, retiring from the game, the window closes that, that code email that says, you know, Spencer Pacinger, Miami Dolphins or Spencer Pacinger, whatever, that doesn't hold as much weight when you're out of the NFL. Like I'm, I'm not a guy that likes to live in the past. So I couldn't in good conscience put Spencer Pacinger, Miami Dolphins or Carolina Panthers in an email header, knowing that I don't play for that team anymore, you know? So I, I take it as once I retired, I had a certain window to get to where I wanted to get and sort of settle in to my next career before it closed. And in doing that, I've definitely felt the pressure of wanting to succeed, of wanting to get more things done in a short amount of time where my wife has had to tell me like, listen, you need to learn how to relax more. You need to sit down. You need to calm down. Like, get off your laptop. Like, there, there'll be times I would just be watching TV in bed or on our couch. And I said, oh, I'm sitting here. I'm not doing anything. Let me open up my laptop and let me send a couple of emails. Let me look at this, you know, proposal deck or something. And she'll close and be like, listen, just watch TV right now. Just relax. Just be here in the now and worry about it tomorrow. So, yeah, it's just that, it's that mindset of like, now that I'm out the game, I'm trying to get into something else and not be part of that statistic that kind of loses themselves. And along those lines, you know, I know after our conversation here, you're headed over to the film set yes. um, of All American, and you've got a kind of an odd opportunity. Um, so on that film set, if you could walk over to the lead actor. You know, who's playing Spencer Yeah, and talk to that character who's, you know, the high school Spencer playing at Beverly Hills High. What advice would you give to yourself, the, the, the high school version of Spencer? Man, I just, I would tell him the high school version of Spencer. I just tell him like at times, just take a moment and pause and just see where you're at, you know, just kind of just, just take it all in take in the feeling of where you're at, you know, feel the grass that you're standing on, breathe in the air that you're, that you're breathing and just really just take a moment and know that, you know, you'll be okay. Essentially. If you just stay on the path and you think it's a good path to stay on, stay on that path and any decision that you make should be the right decision. Like I'm a, I'm a big believer in having an inner voice And I think we're all connected to a higher power, whatever it may be. There's something in us that has that inner voice, that gut feeling, that person in the back of your head that's telling you right from wrong. And I truly believe with any decision that you make, if you take a deep breath and be in the moment for that split second, somehow, some way, the right answer will come to you. And I'll just tell them, just do that. Just, Just take a moment and just taking your surroundings, take in like literally being in the moment and make your decisions based off of that. Well, you saying that just caused me to take a big deep breath. (laughs) And in taking that deep breath, I just came to a real appreciation uh, of you and this amazing story and journey that you've been on. And I'm so excited for you. Uh, And, you know, I hope this pattern of your life of kind of clawing your way to the next level or to the next (laughs) arena and then making it to the championship plays out for you again with all American. I Uh, I hope it's a hit show for you. Congratulations on having your project greenlit and being produced for full 13 seasons, uh, 13 episodes. Uh, Maybe it'll go 13 seasons. I don't know what a high school kid is going to do like episode 13. I mean, (laughs) that's season 13, but if we get there, I'm with it. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. Uh, Well, good, man. I'm wishing you all the best. And this has really been a pleasure uh, to sit down with you. Yeah, thank you. This has been a long time coming. I know we've we've talked uh, over the past couple of months about getting out to Chicago and and just taking to Chicago, doing the podcast and everything. But I'm just, I'm so happy we were able to connect right now, so. Well, great. You're an absolute shining example of an athlete who is much more than an athlete and is doing an amazing job only nine months out of being at the NFL, of reinventing yourself and creating success outside of sports. So keep going, man. I'm rooting for you. I appreciate it. Give the Big Jump a holler on Instagram or Twitter at Big Jump Show. 
On the podcast chart, season one netted a perfect five-star rating for The Big Jump. And if you're so inclined, I would be grateful if you could show some love by throwing us five stars. And if this is your first episode, don't forget to subscribe. And show notes, get your show notes here. If you're listening while driving or are sharpening knives underwater, show notes for this episode and links to everything mentioned can be found at thebigjumpshow.com. When I need a change of pace from podcasts, I love listening to audiobooks on Audible. So I partnered up with Audible to give new customers a free audiobook. They're an Amazon company, so everything just works, and they've got over 180,000 titles to choose from. Just go to thebigjumpshow.com slash audiobook to get your free audiobook, simply for creating a free account. Again, to start off your Audible account with a free audiobook, go to thebigjumpshow.com slash audiobook. Happy listening. And lastly, I want to say thank you to our sponsor, Grand Voyage, a luxury fashion brand and a personal favorite of mine that makes shoes and bags designed in LA and handcrafted in Italy at the same factories as other premier fashion labels, but at a much better value. GQ says they're, quote, changing the fashion game. And Grand Voyage is perfect if you're trying to change up your fashion game. And by change up, I do mean upgrade. Use the promo code THEBIGJUMP for $35 off the beautiful bags and shoes from Grand Voyage. Yes, $35 off. Go check them out. See what I mean by going to thebigjumpshow.com slash shoes. And from there, as they say, the rest is up to you.